So, um, what is this talk about? Testing patients. Um, essentially, I want to go and talk to you all a bit about the history of testing and where we can kind of like consider it to be going over the next five, ten years or so, based upon what I'm seeing within the industry. Um, and this has been a very fascinating area for me because it seems like uh, testing continues to evolve in a wide variety of different ways. Um, early in my career, I got involved in agile software development, and at that time, we had this, re this renaissance of uh, unit testing. And uh, sure, unit testing had been around for decades, but you know, within uh, you know, early agile processes, there was like this, this push towards getting everybody to go and write tests as they were writing their code, and this kind of evolved into test-driven development and all these other things. And then since then, we've had acceptance testing. You know, we've moved into um, a wide variety of numbers of different types of testing. And it's, for me at least, it's kind of hard to go and sort of like get a sense of, you know, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the overview of all this? What is all this about? You know, it seems like every time that you turn around, somebody has a new type of testing they want you to, um, to deal with. And they find a different way to go and have testing augment your process. And um, I don't know, it's just been kind of odd to go and sort of like sit back and look and see as this sort of thing happens from a bit of a, a vantage point and be involved in it, you know, day to day. Uh, years ago, I was invited to a really interesting thing. It was like a, kind of like a workshop slash testing summit uh, by a couple of people who wrote this book, okay? Um, all very notable people in the software testing community, Kem Kaner, James Bach, Brett Predicord. And they invited me in along with a bunch of other developers to go and sort of give them feedback about some of the newer things that were happening in the context of development. And, um, you know, I was really fascinated by that and kind of, you know, honored to sit there and, and work with these guys. But, you know, after a period of time of showing them various different things like refactoring techniques and stuff like this, um, one of us, I forget who, you know, basically put their hand up and said, you know, got all these testing gurus here. You guys, can you just show us, you know, we want to go and see what the taxonomy of software testing is, right? It's like you've got these ideas of like black box testing, white box testing, integration <laughs> testing, unit testing. How does a tester look at these particular things? And I really wish I'd taken a picture at that time of what they drew on a whiteboard because it was like this, it was the most incredible Venn diagram you can ever imagine, right? With lots of dotted lines too because there's so many different ways of overlapping these things. And people use different terminology in different ways. Has anybody ever been involved in one of those wars of like what the terminology around testing happens to be? You know, yeah, and it's kind of, you know, when you look at it, it's kind of like, in a way it's kind of pointless. We know that we have testing that we need to do and what we actually call these things is probably not quite as important. Um, you know, in lieu of actually having a picture of that, um, that whiteboard that we had there, I just pulled this off of a you know, website just showing just how weird it gets, all the different dimensions with which we can kind of try to go and classify testing. <coughs> and so we have this. We have this notion that testing is extremely important. There's all different ways of approaching it. And um, we find ourselves in the industry in this place of like figuring out how to go and augment our development with various different testing techniques. But what's the goal, really, of testing, right? I think the traditional one that we've had in the industry is this, to go and basically say that we should just have fewer errors in production. Make sense? That's kind of where we want to go with these things? Yeah, I wonder if we can actually challenge that a bit, right? Maybe that's not all testing is about. Um, and I'd go and say beyond that, it's like there's just, there are a couple of other things we can kind of dig into. And we might actually end up in seeing scenarios where we don't really need all that much testing at all. I hope to go and talk to you a bit about, more about that. Um, I think the primary thing, though, if we tried to go and reduce this, fewer errors in production to a crisp word, it would be this, quality, right? We want to go and have quality. And there are so many different definitions of quality, but at the very least, we want to go and have code that's out there that runs to completion, doesn't go and cause you know, terrible things, terrible side effects from, uh, you know, based upon the user's intentions. Um, and uh, that should be our goal overall, and testing is one way of enabling that. Um, I had a little bit of a crack in my understanding of this years ago, though. And it came from this interesting uh, insight I had talking to a friend of mine, Steve Freeman, uh, in London. Um, he, was, um, he was basically telling me a bit about some of the early things that they'd done in extreme programming, getting tests around code and stuff like this. And then taking a project and kind of moving it from one domain to another. They were radically reshaping what the code was supposed to do, but reusing extensively all the code that they had. And I thought that was kind of fascinating. And of course, I started to ask him, well, what other testing do you have besides the unit testing? Do you have acceptance testing and all these things? And um, he said, well, no, we don't really have any kind of acceptance testing, but we just found that having unit tests for the code that we had there was enabled us to go and recompose our code in the way that we wanted it to be 
in order to basically sort of like target this new domain, this new area for this application. And um, I was really just kind of stunned by that because I thought, wow, this is kind of fascinating. Um, they don't really have acceptance level testing, but yet they were able to go and sort of change things around rapidly and get to the point where they were able to put something in production and had very few bugs in production. And yeah, I was utterly amazed by this. And this caused me to think a bit about it. I ended up writing a blog post about this, you know, based upon what I was kind of uh, ascertaining. Um, I feel that quite often in testing, there's this flawed theory of testing. And that theory is that essentially you catch bug, the way that you get quality is by catching bugs with your tests, right? You write a test, you run your code, you get a failure, the failure indicates that there's a bug that you've caught. And once you've caught that bug, you can kind of move on and say, yay, my test did cool things for me. But the thing about it, though, is that it's really kind of interesting to notice that the testing itself quite often gives you quality without you getting any errors. You might know what that's about. What it comes down to is this. Essentially, when you are going to write a test for a piece of code, whether you're doing it like TDD style in advance of going and actually writing the code, um, or you're doing it with property-based testing or a variety of other things, you have to think very hard about what it is that you want, right? And if you are still in that loop where you can change your code and write new code and, you know, or just, you're just about to write code, um, that refined understanding goes and gives you the quality, right? And to me, that's utterly fascinating. And it feels in a way then that what that means is that tests that are embedded within our development process are kind of like a trick in order to go and help us actually arrive at quality. And not necessarily through the failures of the test cases themselves. It's a trick to go and think more clearly about the problem, right? So kind of carrying this forward, um, I started looking into a variety of other techniques people had used to go and get quality uh, across the industry. Um, there's this really cool book called Toward Zero Defect Programming by Alan Stavely. And he was involved back in the 80s and 90s with um, uh, a movement called clean room, uh, clean room Programming or Clean Room Design. And this has nothing to do with hiring another group of people to go and sort of create a knockoff of a product. That's how we use clean room today in clean room development. Um, but what he was talking about and what this entire movement was about was increasing quality by being really, really rigorous about development process and really going and taking the idea of like uh, code review and really pushing it extremely hard. And what they did is they eliminated a backstop when they were doing this. They eliminated the backstop of testing. They said, you're just not going to write any tests. We're not going to allow you to write any tests. Okay? The only way that you basically move forward is to get through code review. And so they had a really rigorous process around code review. There was some testing, some stochastic testing, statistical testing to go and sort of like see that certain things are okay and everything like that. But you know, the, the real thing was to go and sort of like eliminate testing as a backstop and still produce quality code. Interesting thing about this is that it worked, right? Um, 40,000 lines of Fortran, bug density, um, 4.5 um, bugs per thousand lines. Um, they basically found as they were doing this that they were getting you know, very, very high quality. The thing about it though is it's really, and the reason why it's never taken off since then, is a really, really rigorous process. You know, it's not just going and having a code review and saying, hey, you know, look at my code. It's like, yeah, it looks good to me, right? It's not that. It's kind of like you sit down and you do this. You essentially, for every piece of code that you have, you write a predicate that goes and explains what it's going to do, what the preconditions are, the postconditions, semantically what it's going to do, okay? And this, these kinds of comments are actually littered in the code itself, right? They are comments, but basically you see the reasoning process laid bare about what the code is supposed to do, right? And um, that's kind of fascinating. And so everybody's got to go and be in review and follow the reasoning process. It's interesting about this, though. Um, do you want to have like really, really big predicates to go and uh, cover your code? Yeah, and the more complicated your predicates are, the chances are the more complicated your code is. You want to keep things as simple as possible because you're relying on the limitations of human understanding to even get a sense that this thing really is working, right? And this kind of aligns with something I discovered years and years ago working in like a design by contract environment where you write preconditions and postconditions. It seemed like every time I started getting into a state designing something where my preconditions or postconditions were massive, I thought, oh, I'm doing something wrong, right? I need to go and simplify my design so that my reasoning about it can be easier and the documented reasoning that I have through design by contract can be much easier also. Funny thing about this, though. In the book, I found something that really fascinated me. 
And um, it was this, okay, this little um, paragraph and phrase. Yeah. So when are the, they call them these, in, these predicates intended functions. You just document intended functions in the code. So when are the intended functions written? They can be written after the code is written. If you did this, you probably use the intended function for each construct to document what you had in mind when you wrote it. Sometimes you might need to look at the construct itself, derive the function that actually computes and use that as the intended function. But experienced programs would probably do things in the opposite order most of the time. They would probably write the intended function first and then write the code, right? It's kind of funny. Does that sound like anything we've been doing since then? So it's kind of like TDD, right? Okay, write down my intention, basically write it down as a test. Write only the code it takes to go and satisfy that test. So you can see that this idea was kind of floating around in the industry even before TDD came along. And it's interesting to notice that this is a way of going and getting quality, but it's really through this. Quality comes from deliberate thought, right? Um, people have said for years that you can't really test in quality, and that's fair. Um, but what we can do is we can use the testing process as a way of going and introducing constraints that go and help us think deeper about what we're actually producing. And it's that thought that goes and helps us out a great deal with these things. Um, so yeah, this is a, an interesting line of thought if you go and carry this further. One of the things that's just kind of fascinating that's happening now is more and more people are moving into functional programming is that we're moving into this uh, realm of going and doing more property-based testing. Many people have done property-based testing, right? And it's it's kind, of a, um, kind of rough when you're dealing with mutable code, but when you're dealing with functional code, it's often quite a bit easier to go and do this. Um, property-based testing is this process where what you do is you kind of model your code in terms of properties, going and explaining uh, what things should accept, what they're going to produce, and you basically model these things in terms of like these properties or constraints. And then what happens is that there's a piece of code that actually goes and takes these properties and generates randomized inputs to your code and then verifies that basically, in each case, the properties that you've, um, you've uh, described have held for the code that you, um, you've written. And it's kind of funny with this because this is very different from what a lot of people do in testing today, you know, in, in many situations, where you sit down and you think about every little edge case and you're doing these various things. So with property-based testing, there is a piece of code that goes and generates for you all of these tests. You can just say, oh, generate, and it'll generate 100 tests for you, and they'll run them. And the thing is, you can check and see what these tests are, but quite often you don't really know unless they actually fail, right? So I'll give you an example of this, you know, from a, a piece online about F sharp. Okay, here's a, um, a case where somebody's going to uh, creating a property to go and show that sorting works. You know, think about sorting in general. What kind of properties can you... Uh, used to go and describe where the sort works. Okay. One thing you can do is say, well, you know, the uh, if, you, um, if you have a sort, then basically afterward every, uh, every element should be like monotonic, it should be ascending within the sort. Um, here we're basically going in saying that if we append a minimum value to the sort, it should be the same as if we prepend the minimum value. You can see this is kind of like mathematical, kind of like algebraic reasoning. You're looking for properties that are going to be true to go and describe something that's going on in your code. And quite often you'll fall back on like, you know, equality properties like reflexive, transitive, symmetric, all these different things in order to go and sort of like pin down in a way the behavior of the thing that you're trying to go and produce, okay? Um, so there's a real art to this. And there's a real skill to going and coming up with good properties to go and describe things. Um, John Hughes, who, was, who did Quick Check, which is the, um, uh, one of the basic t first tools to go and ever do this in the Haskell community, um, has talks out there showing how you can basically use property based testing and go and deal with all sorts of, you know, things you wouldn't imagine applying it to, like performance and, uh, and race conditions and all these other things. It's not necessarily issues of just the values that you have in your code you're going to verify. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to notice is that here's another avenue for us. It's not like traditional testing, but it does satisfy that criterion of forcing us to think deeply about something. We have to go and think, well, you know, here's the thing I want to do, and then we have to be precise about the thing that we want to do and what the properties of that thing will be as we, uh, as we produce it. And of course, there's that thing that's fascinating about this, is that as we're going through that process, if we discover the properties that we are trying to go and, um, and produce have all these crazy edge cases and crazy exclusionary conditions, um, you know, uh, exceptional cases, then we have to ask ourselves, do we really need that exceptional case? 
And if we don't, we end up going in and having simpler software by going in and sort of dropping the extraneous case. So this honing in, this honing in of precision, you know, and being very precise about what we want to produce does produce quality. And, uh, you know, there are other avenues of testing aside from the typical testing that we do that go in and help us arrive at these things. So I really anticipate the property-based testing. We're going to see more and more of this happening across the industry. And the fascinating thing about this, though, is it does kind of require to get people to start, you know, applying this, uh, this property-based mindset, more of a mathematical way of looking at uh, the programming that they do, um, which is a bit different, you know. It's, um, it's what you're really doing is you're making this transition from thinking in terms of just simple examples to thinking about behaviors or constraints that are universally true across a particular uh, thing that you're trying to go and test. So yeah, property testing is a, a, a direction I think things are going to be going in, and it's almost like the next evolution of, of testing. Um, but let's go and transition into something else. You know, it's like it would be easy for us to stay in this place where we think, ah, oh, we just need more advanced forms of testing to go and sort of get quality. Um, but what about this? Introducing hazard to make systems robust. It's kind of loaded, isn't it? This is something fascinating I read years ago, and it's something that we started in Europe, but you see more and more of this happening across the world now. This notion that um, you can get increased safety in uh, automotive systems and streets and pedestrian areas and stuff like this by making things a bit more hazardous, right? Or making things appear a bit more hazardous. So as an experiment they did in this uh, German town, they said, essentially said, look, we're going to be very ambiguous about where the road is, right? And it's kind of going to be like, you don't really know whether you're on the sidewalk or the road. Um, we're going to eliminate uh, like demarcation lines, you know, in streets where you can see the difference between left and right. You don't have like that line se lane separator. So removing lane separators, removing, making the road itself ambiguous with the surrounding area. And you might think, oh my God, this is hazardous because what you're doing is you're basically going in sort of removing the guardrails that pe people, you know, save. But the interesting thing is that at a visceral level, Human beings look at this and they're saying, oh my God, it's dangerous, right? So it's dangerous, I'm going to be more careful, right? Kind of funny. Can we leverage this in software? Can we make programming more hazardous to go and make it higher quality? Does it sound terrible? Yeah. It's a funny thing, auxiliary to this. I don't have a slide for it. I was seeing that, you know, um, they were actually finding that there is like this run-on effect that's happened in automotive safety in the U.S. that everything that they've done to go and make cars safer um, hasn't really, it, it has you know, decreased the number of fatalities and stuff on those lines, but people actually are more reckless driving their cars now than they were maybe 30, 40 years ago because now it's safer. We've made it safer so people can be a bit more reckless. So yeah, kind of funny about this, right? Um, I had an interesting experience in, uh, in university before I got out into the industry. My first programming language was C, okay? And I don't know why I did this to myself. I just thought I'd do something really, at that time, it felt like very hard to do and prove to myself I could be a programmer. So I learned C. I did all sorts of crazy things. I went to, changed my major in university to be a pro programmer, computer science. And in my second programming course, I was sitting next to a woman in the lab. And I was looking over her shoulder and I saw, wow, she had this array subscript out of bounds exception on her screen. She's using Pascal. Anybody remember Pascal at all? Programming language? Yeah, right? And it's like I've been like a, a term and a half into programming at that university. I'd never seen that exception before. And I thought, huh, what's going on here? And then what I realized was that if you have an array of subscript out of bounds in C, all bets are off. You've got pointers dancing over memory, and you basically learn very quickly not to do that after you've done it a couple of times, right? So somehow I built in that native defense to sort of avoid that particular problem. And it came from not really having the safety guards there, right? So this is a very real effect, but it's also, it's also very hard for us to talk about it in the industry because there's a strong aspect of testing which is really all about us going and sort of like demonstrating that we are doing the right thing. We are doing the, the, uh, the robust thing, which, the thing which is defensive. But, you know, really at the end of it, it's really the amount of care that we place in our work that goes and produces quality. It's not really, the test themselves. So let's go and carry things a bit forward and talk about how to be more hazardous in programming. Um, there are some people now who are basically doing this more and more often, just putting it into production, right? Okay. 
Now, that's kind of wild. You say, oh, you know, whatever. It's like, you know, you've, people told us for years and years and years that testing is important and vital, and, and it is, right? So everything, first off, everything in software development is contextual. There's no one right way to do things. Um, but you have all these knobs you can basically turn to and achieve different effects depending upon the risk profile you have in a project. But, um, you know, continuous delivery. You know, we've had this for quite a while in the industry now, and it's catching on. And you can see, you know, essentially what we have your delivery team. We go to version control, building unit tests, automated acceptance tests, user acceptance tests, and then finally release. And so much of continuous delivery is all about this thing of going and saying, let's make this pipeline faster. So that basically when developer writes code, we can put that code into production very quickly, automate all these steps as much as possible in order to go and get things out there. Has anybody ever worked on a team where the tests are slow? <laughs> yeah. So what do you do to what do you do in response to that? Turn them off. Turn them off. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and see, that's the thing that's amazing with this, is that for cultural reasons, quite often in organizations, that's not an option, right? I mean, it is an option, but nobody really wants to go there because nobody wants to be the person who basically has to answer, oh yeah, well we did have a test for that, but we decided not to run it, right? And this is particularly acute when you have a separate QA department, right? Because then it's like their entire thing is to act as a guardrail, make sure things don't get out into production. And then it's like, yeah, we decided not to run that test, you know, that kind of thing. So it's funny about this. Um, in certain circumstances, you can consider doing this, okay? We do all these things. We do, you know, we write our code. We basically hand check it. We verify it. We inspect it run it through a bunch of example test cases, it goes into version control, it goes into release immediately. And if something goes wrong, something goes wrong, right? Now, this is all a matter of domain. I would not want to do this with a medical record system. I wouldn't want to do this with a deep financial system. Maybe if I was working at Facebook, maybe I wouldn't mind so much. It's like, oh, it's like, you know, some people don't have an icon showing up next to their particular status message. And then, what are they gonna do? You know, it's like, oh, I want my money back from Facebook, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really happen, right? So there's all different risk profiles across the industry, right? And so this is the thing. And you know, the thing is we know how to do this now, right? We know that essentially um, taking a page from, say, A-B testing, it's a matter of progressive rollout. It's like, okay, you can figure out which users you have in many web applications who are more tolerant users. It's like, ah, oh, you know, these people won't complain too much <laughs> if I put it out there and find out whether there's any kind of problem or not. And then you progressively roll it out as you find, get more and more, um, uh, as you get more and more feedback that this really is the proper change. Now, I'm not saying, and I don't want you to look at this and say, oh, Michael's saying no more testing, we shouldn't do any testing. But I'm saying that this is an option for certain constrained circumstances, you know? And this is rough for me to go and talk about because for years I've been this guy running around telling people to get more tests in place around legacy code, right? And I still do that. Um, I think that those tests are quite often very vital for going and enabling change and things along those lines. But we'll talk more about that later. So this thing of going and basically using production as a test environment is a strategy that people can use. And really what it comes down to now is that we're able to do this because there are fewer and fewer untended systems in the world, right? Um, my first job out in the industry was working for a medical device company. And I still remember the conversations we used to have about um, if there's something wrong with this code, we can't replace it. It's tied into firmware. The update cycle is going to be ridiculous, and we can't really go ahead and fix it out in the field. So this thing must be right, right? And you know, also the ramifications about people's health and you know, diagnostics and stuff like that. But more and more, we're ending up being in this world where if something kind of goes wrong, somebody can go and sort of step in and do something about it. And uh, you know, we can build mitigating. Uh, strategies around errors in order to go and basically reduce their cost and stuff along these lines. And uh, that's, that's a big change. It's happened a lot in the last five to seven years. You're seeing more and more of this as we move further and further into the cloud and much, just all sorts of ridiculous pieces of software you would never imagine would have an online interface, really do, right? Um, I was reading about this a while back that, uh, gosh, I lose track of how many probes that we sent out into space now, right? And so there's, isn't there one out there, you know, close to Pluto or something like that, and they, they just, they're doing live updates of the software. You know, it's gonna take, it's gonna take quite a while for the software to get up there, but we're gonna go and, we're gonna patch it. We're gonna go and update the software. And it's like, that's across the solar system, right? So more and more, we're in a position where we can correct things that happen out there. And we can leverage that. We have to figure out just, you know, first off, we don't wanna irritate people too badly. We don't wanna cause, don't wanna cause trouble, but it's still something that we can do. 
Another thing I found kind of interesting in this space, which is um, uh, something called programmer anarchy. Has anybody ever heard about this at all? There's a guy named Fred George who had been you know, talking to various different people. Sorry? Okay, great. Fred spoke here yesterday. So you know a bit about this and everything like that. I find this fascinating from the point of view, that, well, one thing, I don't think that, I don't think that 90% of organizations will ever do anything like this, right? Because it's the, the programmer anarchy stuff that he describes is really based upon a particular set of constraints, a particular set of enabling um, situations that he had in his work environment. Um, uh, very briefly to go and describe what this is, um, he was able to go and work in an environment where essentially you don't have to do any real testing. Anybody can use any programming language they want to. No real managers um, and uh, no real you know, analysts. The programmers were making decisions about what to actually build and finding out in production where they're able to make money doing these things. And uh, you know, a lot of the ideas that we're seeing today within microservices came from you know, this particular area where he was exploring this sort of thing with various teams. You know, it's like nobody cares uh, whether uh, um, uh, a piece of code is written in, say, J or C sharp, you know, as long as it doesn't live too long. That's another aspect of program anarchy is for that particular domain, they could write code that didn't live very long. And that enabled a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, interesting practice that you don't see in typical development today. Um, I think, though, that the lesson to this really is that if you can set the context, you can do some very, very interesting things. And, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, now we're seeing with, like, say, microservices that people are taking this idea of, like, any, any team can write any service they want to in any language, and they're kind of pushing forward in this sort of thing. But, you know, you have to go and figure out, are you in the same, are you in the same situation as somebody, that, somebody else that's done this sort of thing? You know, what are the ramifications of going and making that decision going forward with things? The notion of no testing, it's like, you know, some domains you really do need to do testing. It's vitally important. People's lives and money are, are on the line. But it's interesting for us to notice that there can be domains where these things can be loosened a bit. And, um, you know, uh, it seems like long term in the industry, we do things to go and try to loosen these things also. I mean, if you look at things like eventual consistency and kind of like a breakdown of uh, uh, transactionality across many different systems, people are going and saying, this is a hard problem, let's sidestep it. And that can happen in, in many domains and others it can't. Um, so yeah, this is a, a, a thing that's interesting is that we probably will see more stuff going in this direction, I feel. Um, I think another aspect of testing that we need to really talk about though is um, what it means in uh, conjunction uh, with organizational structure. Um, has anybody ever heard this phrase at all? Moral hazard? Okay, this is a term from economics. I think there's a lot of interesting ideas that once you get them, you start to see them every place, right? It's kind of like, um, you know, if you know that somebody's always going to save you, you can be riskier. We talked about that in conjunction with the, the car thing, right? Make cars more and more safe, and then people are kind of like, yay, I'm gonna drive like a, a maniac because my car, airbag, you know, I'm gonna be happy, right? It's gonna work, right? And even at an unconscious level, this sort of thing happens. Um, I think a, a legacy that we really have in the past, which we're breaking down progressively within the industry, is, um, well, I don't know, what do we call moral hazard in software development right now? Is there a term for moral hazard in software development? I think it's this. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and this, you know, I remember this happens all the time, and it's unconscious, it really is, but if you know somebody's gonna save you, it's like, yeah, not quite as careful. It's kind of like the, the thing of like driving and not knowing where the streets are and basically become safer because you become more careful. Now, I think, I'm not saying get rid of QA departments. I think that QA can be a vital function in organizations. It's just that repurposing for performance testing and all these other different aspects of, of testing is really important. When it comes to the actual functionality, um, if we're able to go and sort of do that without the handoff, you know, we're in a better situation because then you know, it's like uh, that old saying, eat your own dog food, right? It's kind of like, as a developer, I should be the person who is basically ultimately responsible for what happened with this particular thing. And if I know I'm ultimately responsible, I'm going to be far more careful about what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, so we are slowly moving, you know, to this model where, be, where by going and closing that feedback loop of accountability and uh, seeing what the, the real effects of what you do are in production, uh, you become much better and we end up with better code as a result of doing it. So that's quality. Let's talk about something else. You know, quality is like one thing that we truly try to go and target with testing. 
What about this? Maintenance. Now, it's funny about this. How many people have heard the term maintenance in a while? Right? I don't know quite what it's like here. It seems like it almost turned into a dirty word you know, uh, years ago that um, somehow we had the idea that, well, projects you know, don't really go away. The code base is going to live forever. It's just a, co a continuous stream of new features as long as the project's alive. So this notion of like we get the design right and we have maintenance is kind of like an antithetical uh, notion to what we have today. But when I'm saying maintenance here, what I'm really talking about is how do we enable change in a safe way for the code that we are actively working with, right? And if you've been involved in the test-driven development community or you've, you've heard about test-driven development, you're doing it, um, you'll, say, you'll hear people talk all the time about, well, you know, it's like, yes, the tests help you with your design, but they also act as this nice backstop. So if you want to go and change things or refactor, you'll discover very quickly whether the behavior has changed by rerunning your tests, right? So really a vital thing to be able to go and do. Um, if we were to have less testing, how would we enable this sort of thing? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I don't think we're anywhere near that. You know, there's something that was derided years ago within the industry, but some people are like investigating a little bit deeper now. The golden master approach, have you ever hear about this at all? It's kind of like going and saying that we have particular data sets that we will go and apply and we can say, look, you know, we have all these data sets, we have a reasonable confidence that this is going and covering the functionality that we happen to have. And if we just go ahead and run things through again, we can see that this produces the same results that we had last time, then we know that we have not changed behavior in a bad way. Now, this was derided early on in, um, in kind of like the early agile practices, process, practices uh, because it felt like it was a, a cheap fix for going and doing things. Uh, beyond that, you can be in a situation where something goes wrong, then you have to go through this debugging process to figure out what really went wrong to go and do things. In a way, it's kind of like poor man's property testing. You're just taking real data and using it in order to go and see that things are still working that way. I can't even anticipate we're probably going to see more and more approaches like this to go and sort of like, you know, not have strict behavioral equivalence for something, but to at least go and say, yeah, chances are, you know, chances are it's kind of the same as it was a little while ago, right? Um, and I don't know. I think that more and more of this stuff is going to happen over time. Uh, the, uh, the benefit that we get from writing tests, you know, doing TDD, getting quality infused, we get that quality effect. We also, with TDD, get the regression that we can use to go and basically do this without, get regression without resorting to this, without resorting to the golden master approach. But um, yeah, you know, we, there are a lot of people who are doing this now. They don't call it this, but it's still a valid approach of, uh, you know, for going and getting behavioral invariance on the large code base. So what else? What else can testing do for us? I think another goal for testing is validation, right? So, let me know what the difference is between verification and validation. Okay, it's like, here it is, really. Validation is the assurance that a product, service, or system meets the needs of the customer and other stakeholders. Verification is whether or not the thing complies with the regulation, requirements, specification, or imposed condition. Okay? And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny about this. What's the ratio of verification to validation that's a applicable today within the industry. I think it really depends upon the particular industry. If you're in banking, if you're in medical devices and various other things, you do have regulatory compliance issues and you will probably have very hard specifications about what it is you need to produce. There are a lot of other areas of software development though where we're kind of moving towards a post-verification world, right? And this is kind of like what we were talking about a little bit earlier. If you can try out certain things in production, what it comes down to is the customer happy? Is this something they can work with? Is this something that doesn't have any, any bad side effect for us or our stakeholders? And if it does, then it's like that's good enough. That's validating that we have something that, um, that you know, can live in production and can be you know, really very good for us. Um, so yeah, I think that that ratio is changing. And again, you know, I don't want anybody to look at me this and say, oh, Mike's looking at every excuse possible to get rid of testing. I'm not really. Well, wait, maybe I am. I don't know. It's a cost. Um, but I'm exploring that space that essentially testing is a very valuable tool, but when we kind of focus more on what our goals are, we can look and see what kind of options we have, and testing's one of them. But there are many other options as well. So kind of like um, to go and sort of like carry this forward a bit, you know, so far I've basically gone and mentioned um, that, uh, whoops, go back to the slide. That these three things, quality, maintenance, and validation, are like the three things we truly tend to go and uh, target with testing. And um, the, um, 
the purposes behind these you know, are really these. The quality, or actually ways of approaching these are these different mechanisms. You know, if we force thinking, we get quality. Um, if we find a way to preserve behavioral invariance, we end up with a better maintenance situation. And um, you know, if we can get people to accept what we have, that goes and satisfies our validation criteria. And if we can find out very quickly whether the people that are using our systems you know, find it valid for their particular use cases, get that feedback, then we get that. Uh, so yeah, testing can support many of these things. There are also other avenues we can use for this. Um, but let's go and carry it a little bit further. What's beyond all of this, right? Um, there's a deep assumption in testing, uh, for the most part, um, that the effort that we expend in doing the testing is going to be vital for us over time. And um, that isn't always true, okay? Um, let's think about this, moving towards transience. What happens when features that we have in our code base and actual code that we have in our code base doesn't live very long, right? So you know, I'm here talking to you. I'm hoping that these are topics that are very interesting to you. I have a little bit of an agenda though, right? I've spent the past 10 years going around and people visiting teams that have really horrible code. And I don't want really horrible code to exist at all in the industry, right? And um, I think that's an interesting thing. So periodically I see this meme come up, this idea that maybe we can delete code. Maybe we can get rid of code over time, right? And uh, I had an interesting conversation with somebody years ago. We were having beers and we are talking a bit and said, oh, what would it be like if you had a code base where Three months after you write any line of code, it just disappears mysteriously and you can't recover it. And you're looking at this and saying, oh, well, this is definitely a, a good beer conversation, right? It's like, oh, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah, wouldn't that be great, it'd be great, stuff like that. But think about the effects of that, though, right? Um, sure, there's ways of gaming it. You can store the source code someplace else and then dig it up and go and do things again. Um, but for anything that's valuable in the system, you'd end up writing it three, four times, right? And you get better and better as you're doing that. And the other thing, too, is like, um, uh, unless you keep adding more and more people, it's going to put a hard limit on the amount of features you can support in your code base if they keep just disappearing all the time, right? Do we need more features or less in software? Less, less right? I mean, and of course, you know, with an engineering perspective, we tend to see things that way. This is really rough for us in the industry right now. I think that we don't really have a good idea of what the carrying costs of code happen to be, right? If we knew how much it costs to carry a particular feature and the code that supports it, the personnel, the, you know, the production support, all these other things, we make better trade-offs, I think, sometimes in, uh, in the industry, but we just really don't have that data yet. Um, and over and over again, too, as technology people, I'm sure you see this where, you know, somebody's asking for a particular feature and they say, hey, we want this particular thing, and you think about it for a second and you think, wow, you know, there's this other feature here. If it wasn't there, adding this new feature would be so much easier, right? And when we recognize those things, you know, First off, it's very hard to measure. Um, second, it's really kind of hard to broach that conversation with the people you're working with. It's like, yeah, well, you know, this would be so much easier if you didn't have that. And uh, they'd be like, well, you want us to get rid of this thing? That's revenue, right? And it's like, well, you say, how much revenue, right? Is it really worth it, right? Um, having these kind of trade-offs being made in a deep systemic way, being, having, being able to have that conversation about the carrying cost of features and code is something that we really should get better at. Um, and if we do, we can probably end up being in a situation where we have transient code, some code that just doesn't really live too long, and then we get to decide how, uh, how diligent we have to go and be about testing it. Um, in uh, Programmer Anarchy, Fred George's uh, you know, process, um, you know, one of the things that they looked at for this is just, you know, in the kind of business that they were in, kind of like putting up an ad and seeing if something sells, and then going and buying the things behind the ad that are gonna, they're gonna sell to other people, all this stuff. These were things that were kind of like sunset very quickly. It's like you, you write a piece of code, you test it out, and you see that you're making money off of it, and it goes away after a month because the sales are closed. And then you're like, oh, okay, so I can just throw away that code. Isn't that beautiful just to be able to throw away code like that? Not every business supports that kind of thing. But it's interesting to notice that some businesses have done that kind of thing. This feels kind of Machiavellian, so I'm really kind of hesitant to talk about it. Oh, what the hell, we can talk like this, right? Yeah. Um, and they ever go to a clothing store and they see a piece of clothing they're going to buy and they say to themselves, oh, that's a really nice blouse or it's a really nice shirt. Um, I'm not going to buy it now. I'm going to come back next week and get it. You ever do that? Yeah. I'd argue less and less these days. You know, when I was a kid, I could kind of count on going to a store and seeing the same shirt in the store multiple weeks in a row, right? Um, 
you know, we, even you'd have like physical catalogs that would show you the merchandise available from a particular merchandise and they'd be around for a while. And that still exists, but there's an interesting thing that's happened in sales um, over the years that um, sales people or people in their marketing have noticed that they can kind of go and g uh, get people past you know, their inclination to procrastinate in sales if they sort of get them trained to understand that their stuff they're trying to buy may not be there in a week or two, right? That's kind of weird, isn't it? Um, how does this really apply to software? Well, we can get people used to change. And if we can get people used to changes that uh, happen in software and say that, wow, you have a feature you like and maybe it's just not gonna be here in a couple weeks and it's like, that's okay. We know that you're gonna find a different way of doing that particular thing. You know, we do that right now quite often in a lot of software and particularly at scale, you know. There's this thing called Twitter, right? And they've been changing you know, the user experience for years, not really asking us, I'm sure they A-B things and stuff like that. But it's like there are things that you grow to depend upon and then they disappear and then they sort of like do things back and forth. We are in many different segments of software getting end users used to flux, changes in functionality and stuff along those lines. But here's the thing that's interesting about this is that we get to go and do this in a systemic way and start to notice that we can apply this in order to, um, to actually get rid of code, right? The trick with this, though, is merging the feature level with the code level, right? It's easy for business people to say, hey, you know, we don't want this feature anymore. We want to do this. The testing shows that people like this better, and it's like we've got other reasons why we want to go and, you know, antiquate this. But the hard bit is tying that back and figuring out, okay, well, what is the code that's really associated with that feature? And having the discipline within the organization to go and say, we are going to get rid of that code. You know, we're just going to get rid of it. And um, that really is vital. I don't know how many... Uh, here um, as developers um, have had this happen where you're looking at a piece of code and you're kind of like, oh, I can't really do this because this thing and this thing and this thing, and then you discover that, that code is really dead. It's not really used anymore, right? And at that point, you realize that the code you've been looking at is a lie, right? That's lying to you. Every code that you, s oh, the code that you see in a code base, um, the default presumption for us is that it's being used. And when it's not, you know, we end up having a skewed view of the system that ends up being kind of problematic for us. Um, so yeah, we, we can push a little bit further towards having transient code, code that goes and gets up being deleted over time. The other side of this, though, is actually rewriting things, right? Um, rewrites have had a real terrible uh, reputation across the industry for years because anybody ever been involved in like a failed rewrite project? Yay, right, okay. Isn't it fun? It's like, okay, rewrite, rewrite. It's like we get to write the whole new thing in a great way and stuff like this. It's, by the way, we have to match all the features that are coming to the old one. And it's like, oh, double work, double work, right? And do all these things. And then, you know, it's quite often these things end up being disastrous in a way. But the thing about this, though, is that, you know, I'm not going to sit up here and, and uh, preach microservices because I think it's just a technology. But to the degree that we're able to modularize our code better, we're in situations where we can conceivably rewrite things and uh, feel comfortable with it, things that are small enough scale. Um, so a friend of mine at Wonderlist, um, uh, Chad Fowler, uh, they were acquired by Microsoft recently, but he's been experimenting with this sort of thing and just getting his developers to go and say, look, you know, if we, he says to them, look, if you want to rewrite any microservice, just go ahead and do it. Don't even tell me about it. You know, if you feel the code's getting too crafty, too hard to refactor, and you feel you can go and replace its functionality, just rewrite the damn thing. And, um, you know, that's a pretty powerful way of working, right? Uh, we know that entropy is a thing, you know, in software development. And, um, uh, you know, I quite often visit teams that have, you know, 30-year-old code that nobody feels they can get rid of, right? But if we can go and get to the point where we can do systemic rewrites for things, um, you know, we're better off than we had been in the past. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... It's there's a lot of trends that are in play right now. You know, this increased modularity that we have to enable rewrites is kind of powerful. Um, the fact that we're moving towards more and more functional ways of doing programming is pretty powerful also. It enables a great deal more that's possible with, um, uh, with property testing and stuff along those lines. Um, I still believe unit testing is a pretty powerful thing. It's a technique we can use in many different circumstances. But testing is evolving, and I think it's up to us to kind of like discover where we need it, what kind of mitigating strategies we can use when we choose not to go and use it as much. And um, that's kind of powerful for us. So I think overall I'll say that, you know, for testing the goal is really less badness, right? And, 
It's, uh, you know, we want to enable quality, we want to enable maintenance, um, and we want to uh, have validation occur. Testing is one avenue for all these things, and we get to explore new types of testing to enable those three goals. Uh, but you also get a chance to go and look at other things to get, we'll enable them to with a little bit less effort. So um, yeah, so that's essentially what I want to come and talk to you guys about. And uh, any questions, comments? Thank you. <laughs>